I, look, I think there's both light and dark in sports, like anything. The light side, though, is what do we learn about? You learn about competition. You learn about not only winning, but losing. What's up, fam? Welcome back to Entrepreneur Hour podcast and Entrepreneur Hour TV, where we create superhuman entrepreneurs. This episode is brought to you by Startup Books, which is my community for entrepreneurs, specifically that are uh, reading and engaging in learning material and using that to turn knowledge into profits. Make sure to check that out in the comments and description below. My guest today uh, is Mike Robbins, and he just wrote a book called We're All In This Together, which I just told him before we started recording that that is an appropriate message and, and a rallying cry for us right now in 2020. So we're going to talk about that. And more specifically, we're going to talk about leadership. Mike, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good, Chris. Thanks for having me. Awesome, man. So tell us, who are you? What do you do? What led you to doing it? Give us your elevator pitch. Well, it's kind of a long elevator pitch. I've never been good at the short, sweet one. I'm but, not good uh, at it either. I get okay. it. <laughs> I mean, look, so I, my, my story is this, and this relates to what I do. I grew up here. I still live in, in the San Francisco Bay Area in California. Mm -hmm. And I was, a, I was a baseball player all growing up. Um, was pretty good at it. Actually got drafted out of high school by the New York Yankees. Awesome, man. Didn't end up signing with the Yankees because I got an opportunity to play baseball in college at Stanford. Uh, then got drafted out of Stanford by the Kansas City Royals and signed a pro contract. The way it works in baseball, you know, you got to go into the minor leagues before you get yeah. to the major leagues. Try to work my way up through the minor leagues. Unfortunately, I got hurt, tore ligaments in my elbow. Mm. Three surgeries later, was finally forced to retire at the age of 25 had to figure out what the heck I was going to do with the rest of my life. Um, yeah. But the thing that I had been most fascinated by when I was playing, two things. I was always fascinated by it wasn't always the most talented people that were the most successful. Mm. And it wasn't always the most successful that were the happiest and fulfilled. And that was interesting to me. I didn't understand that, but I was curious. And the other thing I was curious about was it wasn't always the most talented teams that were the most the best performing teams. Like, like you didn't always, the best players didn't always make the best team. There was some other factor. We called it chemistry in baseball. So yeah. I was fascinated by those intangibles. And then I got my first job, late nineties, working in the dot-com world. And I realized, oh, I thought those things were related to sports. They're not, mm -hmm. they're related to being human. <laughs> it was in business, just like in baseball, just like in life. Yeah. And so I started to study these things. And 20 years ago, after a couple of years in the tech world, I started my own coaching consulting business, really wanting to understand those intangibles of success and fulfillment individually, and then the intangibles of success for teams. And for the last 20 years, the books I write, the work I do, I mean, I get to work with companies like Google and Wells Fargo and Microsoft, big companies, but also work with a lot of entrepreneurs and small businesses, really focusing on some of the things that are in my most recent, my fifth book, we're all in this together. What are those intangible qualities of leadership, of communication, of performance that actually bring out the best in us? Mm, that's fascinating. Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting that you mentioned sports in particular. I was actually, my wife and I were just talking about how intrinsically uh, people, like all my friends that, that, that played sports, whether they played with me or not, right? Like <laughs> these could be uh, friends, friendships that I acquired in adulthood, not necessarily people that I grew up with. Right. There's like this unspoken bond. There's like an understanding, yep. right? Like there's core values that are very similar. There's yep. just a way that we conduct ourselves, the way we view things yep. that I think is a, a really positive, like it's, it's instilled values, right? Yeah. And so do you think that, and for those that maybe engage in sports or, or maybe they have kids that are thinking about engaging in sports, did you find that to be maybe a, a really awesome launching pad for you that, that you found that to be a very similar anecdotal experience? I did. I mean, I look, I think there's both light and dark in sports, like anything, you sure. know, the, the light side though, is what do we learn about? You learn about competition. Yeah. You learn about not only winning, but losing, which is yeah. a really important part of life. You learn about sacrifice. You learn about, you know, sharing, if you will, like not everybody gets the ball, whatever sport you play in basketball, right. you got to pass the ball around football, baseball, you know, it's just, you can't do it alone. Mm. And there's something about sports that, even with all of the issues and challenges we see in our world today on the field or on the court or in the pool or whatever sport it is, there's something pure about it in the sense of it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter where you come from. It's like you jump in the pool or you get on the track and you run and like the fastest runner wins the race right. or the team that scores the most points wins the game. Um, you know, some of the dark side can be, especially now with youth sports and things, the intensity and the focus. Um, yeah. These parents, it's like a cult. It's crazy. Right. 
but, but I do think that what I appreciate about my own experience as an athlete, especially baseball, which is kind of a weird sport. And if you didn't play or you don't follow it, it's easy to think, oh, it's not that athletic and it's kind of boring. And yeah, but the thing about baseball that I do appreciate, there's a lot of losing in baseball. Hmm. The Washington Nationals won the World Series last year in 2019. They lost 41% of their games. Yeah. They lost 69 games in the regular season. They lost another five games in the postseason. They won game seven of the World Series in Houston. They weren't supposed to win. That's a lot of losing for the championship team. And right. mostly, like in other sports, there's not that much losing. You know, the team that wins the Super Bowl doesn't lose usually 41. I mean, they could potentially, but in basketball, you know, you're not going to see a championship team in many other sports have that much losing. And the reason why I say that's important is because I learned, I played baseball from the age of seven until I was 25 and yeah. I was good, but I lost a lot. I had a lot of humbling moments playing yeah. baseball and that actually set me up in a lot of ways for life, for business as an entrepreneur. And when I work with a lot of teams and leaders, learning how to lose and to fail actually teaches us a lot about winning and succeeding and gives us an enormous amount of resilience, which yeah. we need, especially when we're going through things like a global pandemic that none of us yeah. were prepared for is how do we navigate those things? Yeah, I think also too, to get a little bit more nuanced with it, you know, and, and this has been mentioned, this is not like a, a new original thought here. This has been highlighted in many, many occasions. But when you look at baseball in particular, and I would say other sports as well, like golf has been to me one of the most challenging sports that I've ever even attempted. Like it's so hard. Yeah. But let's let's keep it on baseball since that's what we've been talking about. I mean, you look at guys in the Hall of Fame and maybe had a 300 batting average, meaning right. three out of 10 attempts, they got a hit, right? Like yeah. you're failing most of the time. And yeah. even in basketball, I mean, if you're shooting 50%, I mean, you're only making half of your shots. You're like Hall of Famer right. worthy. You're like Larry Bird, right? You're a sharpshooter, right? Yeah. Well, so look, it's I mean, wild even, when you think about that because you are failing on, on such a frequent basis. Totally. And like right now, as people are listening to this, depending on when they are, you know, the baseball playoffs are going on and like right. all you have to do in baseball is get into the playoffs, which is yeah. not easy to do. This year, a little easier with the weird season yeah. and what they did. But any team in baseball, the worst team in baseball has a chance to beat the best team, yeah. which in most other sports, I mean, there are upsets in, you know, the NCAA tournament or there's upsets that happen from time to time in the other sports. But baseball is one of those weird ones. And again, you can be a Hall of Fame, you know, player. You could right. be Willie Mays or Barry Bonds and you could strike out four times or you could right. be, you know, Roger Clemens or Clayton Kershaw and you could, you know, give up a game winning home run and lose the game. Um, you know, Michael Jordan had some bad games over the course of his career, but most of the time mm. he won and he dominated and he was the best or, player on the court. Or he, view, or he viewed and he he channeled his challenges. I think that's one of the biggest things that was, it was interesting watching his, uh, and we'll get off of the sports topic because we yeah. could probably talk about sports for hours. Right. But but I think one of the things that was interesting was was in that, uh, The Last Dance, yeah. that, that, that series that just came out, which was fantastic. If you haven't watched awesome. that, not you specifically, awesome. if anybody in the yeah. audience hasn't watched it, it's literally is tremendous. One of my, yeah. I mean, he's my favorite of all time for a variety of reasons. Yeah. But one of the things that was really fascinating that one of the, you know, analysts or journalists, or somebody made a comment or an observation. It was like, he wasn't the fastest. He didn't jump the highest. He didn't run, but it was focus. Right. Yeah. It was focused in the moment. But I also think that he was able to channel in some ways. Again, you mentioned the dark side of sports. I know yeah. with him, it was it was from a place. And even still, I know he really struggles with just his competitive desires yeah. and how to manage that. Right. Where yeah. he like, can't sleep at night, and has to like listen to Westerns really loud because he just can't turn it off. Yeah. But I think also, too, is that he was able to embrace those specific challenges of that season of his life and view them as opportunities. Yeah. And you mentioned a global pandemic. I have argued for months on this show, let's stop focusing on what we don't have and what we can't do because right. this is a massive reshuffling of the deck and there are going to be opportunities in the world like we have never, ever seen specifically in business. And the faster that you recognize the opportunity and move towards capitalizing the opportunity, you can make massive leapfrogs in your industry, in your market, yes. or create a new market entirely. 100% I agree But I think with when you, you play I... sports, you get that because you yes. get the persistency, you get the tenacity, you get that you're going to have those constant frequent failures right totally well and i think look i remember saying it's funny you bring that up when we first got into the pandemic i said to my wife and this might sound a little obnoxious but i said it to her i was like babe it's really good that you married a former athlete mm -hmm. and she was like okay and I, she loves it when i'm being you know sort of cocky and obnoxious and she kind of rolled her eyes at me and she said and then i said no by me right. what i mean by that is look I don't know what the heck's going to happen i'm scared like everybody else i was really scared when it first happened right sure. 
I said, but what I do know and what you know about me and my wife and I've been together for 20 years, I was like, I am not going to quit. Mm. Our team is not going to quit. We're going to figure this thing out. And I kept saying to my team in the first few weeks, especially, look, I don't know what's happening here. I don't know how long this is going to last. I don't know what this all means. But when this is all over, there's going to be a story. We're all going to be telling this story for the rest of our lives. I keep saying to my daughters who are 12 and 14, pay attention because you're going to be telling this story to your kids and grandkids. But I said, what's the story we want to tell ourselves about how we showed up during this time? Was it, oh, it overwhelmed me and it was terrible and it was awful. And then, or it was like, wow, that was for 12 months. Yeah. Or it was like, wow, that was hard. And it knocked me on my, you know what, but I got back up and we got up and we figured some things out and I can look back now, like a lot of challenging experiences we've all had and say, you know what, that wasn't fun. That wasn't easy, but that helped make me and us who we are. And I absolutely agree with you that that is possible for all of us right now, not to diminish the severity of what's going on, but I think we can tell the truth about challenging times. And at the same time, to your point, take the mindset and the approach that this isn't happening to us. It's actually happening for us if we choose to look at it that way. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And that all comes to, you know, what what I introduced that we were going to talk about was leadership today, because I think what you talked about with your team collectively getting people to move towards the direction of seizing the opportunity versus uh, 2020 is a wash. No, 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 no. 2020 is a huge opportunity, right? If you're right. looking at it as such. So yeah. one of the things that, that you talk about in your upcoming book that I want to really focus on, because again, we're going to talk about leadership today. And it's going to be the primary yeah. focus of our, of our discussion. But I wanted to talk about, you, you go into and explore, and I haven't read the book yet. I, I will really acknowledge that. <laughs> I'm going to. Yeah. Uh, but you talk about trust and healthy relationships, right? But, but my yes. question is, and, and, you know, kind of rallying around those things, I think it's really, really important as a leader, right? And that seems like what you're demonstrating. Yes. How do you navigate that without losing a degree of professionalism? And what I mean by that, let me provide some context. What I mean by that is some people will put their hair down or let their hair down and they try to like communicate and build trust and relationship with their, uh, with their, with their peers, their coworkers or, or yep. their subordinates, what have you whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, and what they end up doing effectively is kind of people can't handle not having the dynamic of boss employee relationship. Yeah. So how do you manage it? What boundaries do you establish for yourself whereby people still have that respect for you as the leader, right? But we are all still building those relationships and moving towards a collective effort. Look, it's a great question. And I think there's actually a couple layers to it. So first it depends on what we're doing how many people we're doing it with. You know, again, running a business where it's just you and maybe a couple other people is different than running a business where there's 20 people or 50 people or 100 people or 1,000 or 10, you know what I mean? So the context changes and the role that we play changes. That said, the, the, the analogy or the example that I like to use to understand the difference, because I talk a lot about authenticity. Right. But to think of it from a leadership context, if you're the leader, like you're in a leadership position, you have people who report to you, however big or small your company is, think of it like you think of yourself like a, like a captain or a pilot of an airline. Now, again, most of us aren't flying these days, but you know, when just think, you know, when you're on a plane and you go through some turbulence and I was flying a lot prior to all of this, you know, traveling around the country and around the world speaking, I'm not a huge fan of turbulence. I don't think anybody is. But when we go through turbulence, what's helpful is if the pilot comes on before you hit the bumps, if possible, and says, hey, we're going to hit some bumps, right? Because they're coming and we just want to let you know, we'll do the best we can so you're prepared. Every now and again, the bumps come out of the blue and they might come on, so sorry, we didn't see those coming, but there's communication. So letting us, here's what's happening, here's what's going on, here's what we're doing, here's what we're going to try to do, here's how long I think it's going to last, we're going to try to get through it. So a good, strong, authentic leader communicates proactively, authentically, transparently about what's happening, what's going on. Now, if you, using this analogy, if you're the pilot, you're the captain, then you shut off the microphone and let's just say it's really, really bad, like it's stormy and it caught you off guard and things are, then you say to the people in the cockpit, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is a little scary. We're going to have to hunker down and really figure this out. That's a conversation you have in the cockpit with sure. the other people who are flying the plane. You don't have that conversation mm. with everyone because if I hear the pilot go, I've never seen it like this before. We might crash. Like that's going to freak me out and yeah. I can't do anything back. You see what I mean? So I say that because what you need as a leader is you need to have people, whether it's your, your leadership team or maybe it's your, your spouse or your mentor or your coach or people in that inner circle that you really can lower the waterline on the iceberg and tell the truth. I'm freaked out. I'm stressed out. I don't like this. I don't know what's going on. 
with your team. There may be moments that it's appropriate to share some of that, but it's not for me as much about professionalism or not professionalism. It's about trust and it's about sharing as much as you possibly can without oversharing. I think of this also as a parent. It's like our girls are 14 and 12. We try to be as transparent and authentic with them as possible. Right. But we don't share stuff that's inappropriate for them to know about our marriage or about our finances or whatever. Cause like right, right, right. they're 12 and 14. You know, they don't need to know that. They're like, oh, dad's freaked out about paying the mortgage if that, you know, when that was the case many years ago. Like, I'm not going to tell my three year old daughter that because what the heck is she going to do with that information? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we have to be mindful of the moment that we're in, the team that we have, and what's going on. But the, th- the trap that I see, Chris, that leaders fall into, is this sense of thinking like, I'm supposed to be tough, I'm supposed to be strong, I'm supposed to have it all together, which then just creates an enormous amount of pressure that that isn't healthy. Yeah, I like those metaphors because I think what happens, and and I, you know, you're talking about it, I I follow a lot of Brene Brown's work, I know she talks about authenticity, and that's kind of one of her main focuses, and vulnerability and what have you. And I think people have taken those terms and they don't entirely, and she talks about the difference between authenticity and like kind of just, uh, treating people like they're your therapist, right? right. And there's a right. really dis- distinctive fundamental difference. difference between those two. And I think your metaphor really sums it up perfectly, right? Yeah. As to, you know, we don't necessarily understand authenticity. And thus, I think what you're seeing is a lot of leaders kind of going the opposite direction, right? Of not being the strong, like, I don't share anything. And this is, you know, I, I'm buttoned up and I wear my suit and tie and my three-piece suit. And that's how I right. conduct myself in my business. Whereas now I think some people have gone completely the opposite direction, right? And they are yeah. divulging too much and sharing too much. And I would argue too, and and we we mentioned this before we started recording today, but uh, about when we're rec- when this is going to be released is right before the election. And I think yes. that's one of the harder things that's going on in the world right now with politics is that yeah. you have these mediums, you have these platforms like Twitter, for example, right. where you have direct access to all of your your potential voters. And so they're sharing a lot of information or not sharing a lot of information or it came out that they didn't share information. And so it just has created these crazy complexities and dynamics that we've never had to juggle or deal with before. I think it's just a very yes. confusing time in the world where we're making rapid transitions as far as who we are as a people and how we conduct ourselves as leaders. Yeah. Well, and it's a, good, it's a really good point because I think sometimes what we get confused about, Chris, with this, and I've studied authenticity for the last 12 or 13 years, the difference between honesty and authenticity. Sure. And the difference is like you could express, I could express an honest opinion. Let's say about something political right now, who I'm voting for, who I want to be the president. I could express an honest opinion about all kinds of things. And not that there's not a place for us to express honest opinions, whether it's at work or on Twitter, if we choose to. Sure. Authenticity though, the way I define authenticity is yes, it's about honesty, but we have to remove something from our honesty and we have to add something to it. The thing we have to remove is our self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is that sense. That's such an important one. I'm right, you're wrong. Now there's a difference between self-righteousness and conviction. Conviction is I believe this to be true, I'm willing to engage, but I have enough humility, enough self-awareness to realize a couple things. First of all, I might be wrong. Second of all, at the very least, I know there's another way or many other ways to look at this thing that I can't currently see. And then we got to add vulnerability. Yeah. It's what I call the authenticity equation, right? It's honesty minus self-righteousness plus vulnerability. And you brought up Brene Brown earlier, right? Brene defines vulnerability this way. She says vulnerability is risk, emotional exposure, and uncertainty. Yes. And think about that in the context of business, in the context of entrepreneurship, in the context mm-hmm. of leadership, risk and uncertainty not just during a pandemic, but in general are always baked into the process if we're going to be successful, right? Yeah. Now, the other piece around emotional exposure, though, that doesn't mean we tell everybody everything. In fact, there are a lot of leaders that I work with who are incredibly authentic, build an enormous amount of trust, and they're very private. They don't share a lot of personal details about themselves. What they're willing to share, though, is how they're feeling. Mm. So the difference, again, if I say, I think that candidate is an idiot, or I think this thing is stupid, or I think, or let me tell you, my wife and I got in a fight, and here's what's going on at home. Those are all like details or opinions or, or disclosures. But what if you said, I'm feeling excited and I'm feeling nervous about what we're doing right now, or I'm feeling right. I'm feeling grateful that we have this team and I'm feeling angry and disappointed because of the lack of our performance or whatever. Like those get into more of universal human experiences and feelings. And they're not so much, they're not going to damage our credibility. They're not oversharing about stuff that we haven't necessarily processed, but they're letting the people around us know Mm. 
here's what's really going on inside of me and giving everyone permission. It's okay to be a full human being. You know, my last book before we're all in this together was called Bring Your Whole Self to Work, Mm -hmm. which is all about meaning it's okay to be all of who we are. A lot of us, especially us men, Chris, we've been taught like there's only like a couple of emotions we're allowed to have in general. You can have a little bit of anger, you can have a little bit of excitement, (laughs) but other than that, you're supposed to just like check your emotions at the door and then show up and do work. And it's like, that never worked for me as an athlete. That doesn't work for me as a, in business. It doesn't work for me as a father. It just, it doesn't work because we're, some of us are more quote unquote emotional than others, but we're emotional creatures and you want people. It's so funny. I hear leaders all the time say, I want my team to be engaged. I want them to be passionate. And it's like, and then someone gets really upset or someone gets sad or someone gets scared and they're like, nope, not that. And I'm like, you can't, right? Brene Brown talks about this. You can't selectively mute emotions. So we got to create an environment that's psychologically safe enough that we can bring all of those and we can still do that and be professional. Yeah, that's fantastic points. Uh, one thing I want to ask you about, I, I was, as you were, you were talking, I thought about this, not just with the, the social media application, but also within the context of, you know, leadership in your organization. But I was reading Influence by Dr. Robert Cialdini and he was talking about, they kind of shared about contact theory, I think is what it was called. Mm. Uh, but basically it presented that in situations where people put in competitive environments and they were just kind of blended together. And he gave a couple of different examples. One was uh, racial relations within schools that have been integrated. And they actually show that it, it worsened the racial relations, not improve them with integration of schools, which some people find that to be just, oh my God, that's that's appalling, right? But it was the reasons because under the, under the, the context of pure just competition, you always kind of vehemently create these enemies, so to speak, because you, yes. you, you're, you're, you see them as adversaries, right? right? So here's the deal. This is why I want to bring this up because I think this is a really important topic of conversation. And feel free for those to research further on that. That's that's as much as I'll get into it for now. But um, within the confines of both, as I mentioned, social media, I think that's a huge problem right now is what you said. I'm willing to admit that I'm being wrong. I'm willing to lead with vulnerability. It's everybody... Everybody, I always say this, every every election cycle, everybody becomes a political expert. During right. coronavirus, everybody was a, a, a viral, virologist, right? Like everybody everybody becomes an expert online and no one's willing to just be like, this is what I think. And I don't know if it's wrong, right or wrong, but this is kind of the lens of what I see it to be, right? Yeah. But here's the deal. That's why I want to bring this up. Within, uh, within your organization, how do you present an environment where you do have, you know, that, that, Let's go, let's get it done. Let's be authentic. Let's lead with vulnerability. But then how do you kind of have that collaborative competitive environment where you don't start creating tribalism within your own organization or friction or, or dislike or disdain or what have you? Because I think that's an important part of managing yeah. your, your people. It, it absolutely is. And it's, it's, it's easier said than done. It's a constant nurturing process. Look, the first pillar in in we're all in this together is about creating psychological safety, which I referenced earlier. What psychological safety is, is group trust. Mm -hmm. It basically means the group is safe enough for what? To make a mistake, to disagree, to challenge each other, to see things differently, to fail, not that we want to. And what we know, there was a study that they did at at Google a few years back that got a lot of attention called Project Aristotle. They spent Mm -hmm. three years studying what are the necessary conditions to create high performance for teams. And what they came back with was some findings after this three-year study. And the number one, by far most important component they found was psychological safety, which honestly, when I read, I didn't know exactly what that was. So I started to research a little more. And I talked to Karen May, who was the head of learning and development at Google at the time about it. And I asked her, were you surprised by the findings? And she said, we didn't totally know what this psychological safety thing was. Once we realized, oh, it's group trust. We weren't surprised that that was important. What we were surprised by is how important it was. And so you can create a competitive environment, but remember that there's two types of competition. Negative competition is when we root against each other and we're pitted against each other. And some organizations, especially even like sales organizations, others sure. literally set it up that way. He's cut there's, some, there's some weird notion from an old school way of thinking, like that makes everybody better. We're all fighting for a <laughs> yeah. limited amount of resources. But what we know, and I know this as an athlete, that actually is catastrophic for yes. chemistry of the team. Positive competition though, is when we compete with each other and in the competition, we make each other better. Right. So, I mean, even just think about this as a, you in your own business, there's probably other podcasters and other people out there who you admire, you respect. Maybe if you're anything like me, you might get a little bit envious of or jealous of or go, wow, look at them. They're so great. 
we can take that in a positive way and say, I'm going to be inspired by someone else's success. Even if they're not on my team, they're just out there in the world and I see them. But let's say you're in a community or actually part of a team together. Wow, he or she is so good and so talented and so great. That's going to challenge me to be my best, to bring my A game. And I'm going to do that and hopefully challenge them and everyone around us. Like I learned this as an athlete, success is contagious. So is failure. So if we can, can create an environment, it's safe for us to compete with each other. Yes. But it's not competing like rooting against each other and trying to one up each other. It's competing right. like pushing each other. And it's, and again, it's a fine line, but that is one of the key components to really creating a strong team and being a strong leader that you communicate that, that everybody knows from the leader, we're all in this together. Right. But if the leader starts calling people out and singling people out in this way that pits people against each other, whether they're conscious of it or not, that creates that kind of dynamic. Again, we do this with our kids and we don't even mean to. It's like, oh, now I've just created an environment where my kids are competing with each other for my attention. Wait a second. Right. That's right. not my job as a father. Like I'm failing if that's what I'm doing. Yeah, and I think and that's the, the hard same part. <laughs> yeah. I, think that's the, I think that's the hard part because, you know, we have, we have an entire team of, of, you know, with one of the businesses that we run uh, and we've got, you know, we're not a big team. We've got eight full-time folks yeah. and, it's always a challenge because if you give one of them what we call bravocados, if we give one of them a bravocado, nice. you're, you're trying to, to encourage the entire team to yes. applaud and celebrate that win. But at the same sure. time, if somebody else hasn't gotten a bravocado for a while, maybe they start building some reasons. So practically from that standpoint, it sounds great in theory. Like, yeah, we want to have a collaborative. We want to be working towards a common goal. We want to be doing this yes. and that. But then when you actually nuance it down further, it's really difficult to know exactly what that looks like in terms of the steps that are required and how, like, what's the blueprint look like? And yes. I assume that's more of what your book really covers in its entirety of what those practical applications look like. But is there something, anything you'd like to tease? Well, there is. Yeah. I mean, along those lines, and I love the Bravo Cados, by the way, that's a great, but so one of the distinctions that I talk about to leaders and to teams all the time related to what you were just saying is the difference between recognition and appreciation. Mm. We use those words interchangeably, kind of like honesty and authenticity, but they're sure. different. And so a lot of my work is actually sort of distilling out distinctions with things and looking at what, what do they really mean. So recognition is a bravocado, is a way to go, is a good job. It could be informal, like we just say, hey, great job on that project or way to go. It could be more formal, like you get an award, you get a bonus, you get a promotion, you get some, right? But it's a reaction to a performance, a result. Right when I was a pitcher in baseball, I'd throw a great game and everybody would give me high fives and way to go, Robbins, you did awesome, right? That's all recognition. Appreciation, on the other hand, is about valuing and caring about people. Interesting. So what that means is as a leader for you with your own team, anybody listening as a team, your job as a leader is to constantly proactively cultivate appreciation amongst the team. And you're not the only one responsible for it, by the way, everyone. Right. But that means we listen to each other. That means we care about each other. That means we're curious and invested in each other. And in this virtual world that we're in now, some teams are set up to be virtual and distributed anyway. All of us, even if we're not, we're forced that way. We have to be more proactive. We have to get on text or on Slack or on Zoom or whatever. And, but valuing people is something we do all the time and we nurture that. We recognize people when they deserve it. And most people, even like back to my days in sports, I didn't expect to be recognized as much as someone else who was performing better than me. We sure. understand it's a meritocracy. Most people get that. You, people want to work in an environment that like, hey, if everybody gets bravocados all the time, they don't mean anything. It's like, right. well, he's just doing that to be nice. Right, you want right. that thing, even if it's just you saying good job to really be valuable. So it, there's a, there's a, I don't like to use the word scarcity, but there is a scarcity to it if it's going to be valuable. We have a high bar. We let people know they do a great job when they really do a great job. When they really did, yeah. And then it becomes valuable and that's motivating. Even if I'm someone who doesn't get much, it's like, well, I got to work harder then to earn some of that. But at the same time, I know the whole time, Chris really values me, cares about me, has my back and right. demonstrates that all the time, irrespective of my performance. Then when I do something worthy of recognition, I get some recognition. Now I'm more motivated to do it again, but not thinking that I have to do it in order to be accepted and be valued, if that makes sense. Sure. So that could look like then the appreciation side of things could look like you actually taking time to not necessarily be personally involved in their life, but to show and to demonstrate that you care about them as a human being, not just yeah. the work that they conduct. Totally. I, I interviewed one of my old coaches from Stanford on my podcast about a year ago named Dean Stotts. He since has retired, but he was there for 37 years, had a ton of success. Dean's a great guy, friend, mentor, 
very different than me, sort of temperamentally, personality, kind of an old school. But, but he said something so simple, Chris, when I talked to him. I said, Dean, what was your coaching philosophy all those years coaching at Stanford? He's like, well, it evolved over time as I grew and matured. He said, but I would describe it this way. He said, Mike, I believe that if I was going to be successful as a coach, I had to love you hard so I could push you hard. Yeah. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, I had to first establish that I loved you and cared about you and valued you as a human being. If mm -hmm. I did that and you really got that, then I could push you as hard as I needed to push you to get the most out of you. And when he said it, I thought, well, that's a great, obviously he was talking about in the context of coaching baseball, but that's true for any leader, whether they're in a big company, they're the CEO, whether they're a small business owner, like we got to love people hard first, care about them first then we have permission to push them. It doesn't yeah. work the other way around. And so many leaders, I think, Chris, forget that. That is a big part of your job as a leader is to constantly, doesn't mean you're going to like everybody and that everyone's going to be your cup of tea and that you're going to have a ton of things in common with everybody. But it does mean you can absolutely care about people and value them, listen to them, take interest in what matters to them. Those things don't actually cost any money and they don't take right. that much time. It's more just intention. I think people hear things like slow to hire, quick to fire, you know, and yep. kind of follow the good to great methodology, which I'm a firm believer in. However, I think the only, this is where it gets really difficult to disseminate information and then to put it into practical application, because I think many people don't realize the time it takes to actually build those relationships that you're talking about to show that appreciation for them as a human being. Yep. And thus they're not patient enough to actually develop that relationship and they move on because they've heard slow to slow to hire, quick to fire. Yes. Would you, would you agree with that? Or how do you kind of layer that on top of what we're already talking about here? Look, I think the slow to hire, quick to fire is a really good mantra. It's, it's tricky, particularly I think when in small businesses that can play out both in an easier way, although there's more challenges in a big organization. I do think though, with respect to appreciation, it's less about, yes, it does take some time. It's less though about quantity and it's more about quality. Got it. So the leaders that I work with, whether they work at Google or they work at Microsoft or they work at Chevron, or again, they're, they're running their own small business or part of a small business. It's the intention. Mm. I'm going to be very intentional. And especially now where the only way most of us are connecting is on Zoom or- Sure. I, I'm going to be really intentional when I meet with someone one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, we'll have an agenda and things we need to talk about. But a big part of that reason we're connecting mm. is for me to connect with that other human, human to human, and to talk through, because everyone's wired a little differently too, to like customize our relationships to each person, to let people yeah. know, listen, I want you to feel valued and appreciated and cared about by me. I'm yeah. going to do everything I know how to do to do that, but I'm not an expert on you. Even if we've worked together for a few years, sure. you got to tell me, what do you need? What do you want? What gets on your nerves? What fires you up? What yeah. makes you tick? Because the more I know that, the better leader I can be with you. And I think sometimes we don't have that vulnerable conversation with people. And then we're just sort of leading them or managing them the way we want to be led and managed, which by the way, doesn't necessarily work for them. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. I, I think um, maybe an opportunity that people can seize on, this is the way I view it. And tell me if you agree with this or not. Um, when we talk about slow to hire, I think that's the time. I think a lot of people make the mistake of, and I see this often, is they're focused on the skills that someone has, right. not using that as an opportunity to see if they're the right fit for what you're doing, but also that's your opportunity to show that you appreciate that person. And when you hire them, that is the ultimate appreciation of who they yes. are because you recognize that they fit both, they jive with you personally and your values, but also with the company's values. So that's already been established if you're yes. doing the hiring process right. Yes. That's how I see it. Yep. Absolutely. I agree. Cause I, and I think that that's a point too. I always think about this when hiring people. And when I talk to people about hiring, you want to be as open and transparent mm. as possible. Look way back when my wife and I've been together for 20 years, she did this great thing. We've been dating for a couple months. And she said to me, look, I really like you. This is going well, but we need to make sure we tell each other everything about each other at this uh -huh. point. Because my wife is she's actually a couple years older than me. It was basically like, I'm not going to waste a bunch of time here. Yeah. I need to know. Like, do you have a bunch so, of crazy skeletons in your closet? Do I need to know some crazy stuff about you? Let me, you know, and it was kind of a weird conversation at first, Chris, but I appreciated it. And it was right. in the context of us dating and getting more serious. But I think about that too, in terms of hiring people. It's like, you want to let people know when I hire people, I always say, look, I'm going to tell you some stuff about some of the dark side of me and working with me and on our right. team. 
Exactly. Not to throw myself or anyone else under the bus, but just know what you're signing up for. Exactly. And you got to be game to sign up for this because I think there's a lot of light side and a lot of positive side too, but I'm not going to like put on my nice shirt and my best behavior and act like this to court you. And then all of a sudden you come on board and it's like, whoa, who's this guy? You want to give them a real sense of what it actually is. And you want to try to get as much of a real sense of them as you can. You can't recreate the stress and the challenge of real conflict and real stuff that comes up, but yeah. we can talk about those things proactively and try to be as open and transparent about it as possible. Yeah, I love that. And I love that your dating was as mechanical as an audition. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it was, she was like- Those are my I words, know. not yours. Yeah. <laughs> that's but, you really know, what, what it is. But, but, if you look at it, it mechanically, that's really what dating is. It's, it's, it's true. And at some level, what's great about that and what I appreciate about Michelle, my wife, who I've learned so much from over the years, is that like understanding the importance of us being real with each other, mm. you know? And, and a lot of times at home can turn into like a business where it's like you start having kids and you have life and businesses yeah, right. and things happening, it gets very transactional. And Michelle and I have to keep coming back to like, look, one of the things I write about in the introduction of We're All In This Together is like our first team is the family that we grew up in, how we learned about sort of teams and groups. The team that we have now, if we have a family or a relationship of any kind, it's like that's often the prism by which we're looking at things. So to me, especially as an entrepreneur and a small business owner, the foundation of my family, which is true yeah. for people wherever they work, is so important to everything that I do. Right. So like if Michelle and I get in a fight, which, you know, happens, like I got to work that out because I love my wife and it's important. But I also know that actually impacts me as a leader, as a business owner, as a father, every aspect of my life because it's my primary relationship. Of course. Yeah. So I always like to give people I I examples to yes. model and to replicate. I've done this extensively, right? Yes. And I think sometimes you mentioned something about competition, and I think this is really important to notate. Uh, and you mentioned other fellow podcasters, but I look at other businesses that run similar businesses to what I run too. Yep. And I used to, I used to um, prevent myself from doing this previously out of yep. fear, probably out of uh, maybe a sensation of being behind right? Yes. Or lacking the resources that they had. And I would just kind of prevent myself from not analyzing what they were doing and le rather than looking at it as breadcrumbs, right? Like, yes. okay, not only have they done it, are they further ahead of where I'm at, but I can then follow that and exceed what they've done because I've learned from their mistakes potentially. Right? Totally. I think that's a good way to look at it. So who are some good examples as you would see it as far as leadership's involved in terms of everything we've been talking about kind of wrapped up in one? I know you mentioned several, I think you mentioned like Chevron or I don't know, some yeah. other companies, but who are some companies that you would recommend our audience go follow and look to for those breadcrumbs so that they can be implementing and conducting leadership in a way that is going to be fruitful for what they're trying to accomplish? Well, I would say two things. I think it's a great question. I think the first thing I would say to what you were just alluding to, I have some examples that I'm happy to share, but thinking about the business that we're in and looking for other people we can emulate who are in similar businesses. Right. I've been super fortunate over the years to have a ton of mentors and one of the things from when I started 20 years ago, even to this day, when I find myself getting <clears throat> envious of other people mm. who have thought leadership businesses or they're authors or podcasters or you know speakers like what I do, sure. what I'll often do is look at what do I admire about them? And is there a way, and nowadays it's much easier than it was even 20 years ago, can I reach out to them yes. in some way, shape or form and say, first of all, thank you because I admire you. Second of all, is there anything I could do to support what you're doing? Totally and third agree. of all, you know, because there's so many ways we can collaborate. So that I recommend yep. that as a best practice to everyone. And so there's people that I look at, like Brene Brown, who you mentioned earlier, like Simon Sinek, like my old mentor who sadly passed away, Richard Carlson, who wrote Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, or other people that I've met along the way or look at. Mm -hmm. Those are people I admire. But in business, there are leaders like, you know, Jeff Weiner, who just recently stepped down as the CEO at LinkedIn, and they're a client of ours. He's now chairman of the board. But one of the things about Jeff that I really admire and appreciate is he talks a lot about compassionate leadership. Mm. And if you have a chance, even if, you know, just Google him or look at some, you know, YouTube videos of him speaking about this, it's incredibly inspiring. There's a company that we work with called Nutanix that's a cloud computing company that's really grown significantly in the last decade. And their CEO, who's actually just about to step down, um, Deeraj Pandey, is somebody I've gotten to know. And he's someone I believe has one of the most, the highest IQs and EQ combination of anybody that I've ever met. Or if you look at a company like it's an easy example and it gets used all the time, but I've had a chance, we've had a chance to partner with them over the last decade, which is Google. And one of the things about Google that's extraordinary to me is wherever you go, now right now everybody's working from home, but if you travel anywhere in the world, 
you go to their Mountain View headquarters or you go to their small office in Buenos Aires, Argentina or anywhere, the people and the environment are similar, even if they're different culturally, wherever they are around right. the world. Like that's something extraordinary. If you're looking at how do you scale and grow a culture and have an enormous amount of success. Like in one of the things that Google has done that I think is really important is they made a commitment. When I first started partnering with Google 10 years ago, mm. they had internally within the company, something called the school of personal growth, which mm. I thought, especially a decade ago, first of all, sounded weird. And I was like, what is that? And they were like, it's programs and courses that are on personal growth and development, on mindfulness and meditation, on wellness oh, yes. and well-being. Now, those things are mainstreamed in a lot of companies these days. Right. 10 years ago, they weren't. And 15 right. years ago, when they first started doing it, they definitely weren't. They, they realized if we take good care of our people, yeah. our people will be engaged and they'll take care of our business. And Google at the time had 10,000 employees. They now have over 100,000 employees. So, I mean, again, most of us aren't running companies like Google, but if you think about what's the culture that I really want to create, what are the core principles of that? And then how do I replicate that with both how I hire, as you and I were just talking about, sure. but also how do I infuse that into the things that we do and the things that are important to us? Yeah, that's really, really fascinating. It's it's funny you say that about about somebody like Google because that, if you look back through, through the lens of like 30 years ago, would have been like the biggest no-no. They'd have been like, well, this is, this is a place of work. This isn't a place of play. This isn't a place of, right. you know, and it's they've created such a, what many would perceive to be a lax environment. But my thing has always been, why wouldn't you create something that people actually want to go to, right? Yeah. Don't you think they would be like, I'm going to cling to this thing because this is the best job I have ever had. I cannot believe the benefits and the way these people care about me and take care of me, help me improve as a person and improve my the quality of my life and give me utility, all yes. these various things, right? Why wouldn't you want that? This is one of the things that, that we, go ahead, go ahead. I see you're trying to say well, something. And, and I'm just, you can do that. I mean, there's a company down in San Diego called Hughes Marino that I've been, they're a commercial real estate company. Yep. And I've been partnering with them for the last nine years. If yep. you just Google them and check them out, they've got 120 employees. They've got offices now in a few different locations in Seattle and the Bay Area and down in Southern California, New York. They, when I first started working with them 10 years ago, nine years ago, they had 15 people, brokers in a really difficult industry that's pretty competitive and commercial real estate is not like what you think of as like Google. Right. They invested so much in their culture. And I yeah. say this to them all the time. When I go to their offices, I have a similar feeling like at Google. The people who work for Hughes Marino are so proud and, that's and awesome. the, the owners, Shay and Jason Hughes, who own Hughes Marino, have invested in their employees and in their company in such a remarkable way yep. that it, it's, real, it's palpable. And you meet people and they say all the time, my friends are all jealous of my job because I work mm. for this great company. There's this. And so I say to people all the time, like, you don't have to be Google and some Silicon right. Valley tech company to do this. No, you can 100%. do it. You know, I mean, again, your team of eight, whatever it is we're doing, if we, if we invest energetically and have the intention of mm. we're going to care about these people we're going to build a strong culture that we all believe in think magical things can happen and look you can have a big brand and a lot of people and an incredible product or service or, or series of those things and that's no guarantee you're going to have a strong culture yep totally agree one of the things that uh that we did which is a, a huge transformation in my opinion that's fundamentally different in terms of you know our industry specifically you know in, in information products uh, was our team's entirely remote, which that's not dissimilar, right? In, right? in information products, you know, kind of an e-commerce brand like that, that's not uncommon to see your entire team is remote, which is interesting because with the global pandemic, it didn't really affect us at all because we were already working right. remote. Um, so anyways, one of the things that we said is some of the people that run their business in that capacity, what they do is they make you take a screenshot of your computer when you start and when you end. Reason being is they want to see what time it was that you started working when you ended. Here's the deal why that's such a fallacy that they're telling themselves like, oh, well, I'm keeping control over you. It's like they could have taken a screenshot, gone to bed and woke up and taken it again that's at right. five o'clock and pretending like they were actually working. <laughs> right. Like right. it's so ridiculous the things that we, you know, be there at a certain time, structure, do this, do that. Right. And I, and there is merit to some of those things, like having some form of structure. You don't want it to be just total chaos. Right. But one of the things that we said was, look, here's the deal. We know we can't like you're going to do what you're going to do. Right. Like that's fine. But here's the deal. Here's what we expect to get done. Right. So if you want to work at midnight and you want to do your thing and you get it, you get your work done, right. Is editing videos or whatever it is. Like one of our guys, hi, AJ, uh, he edits my <laughs> videos, which is why I know he's going to see this, right. but he, he'll be, he's notorious for me messaging him at three in the afternoon, my time he's in the Philippines, 4am and he's up still working on stuff. 
Right. And I'm like, as long as the work gets done, it gets done. I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to advocate that for his health. And I tell him sure. that, sure. but you know, so one of the things that we've really advocated for is results, not, not necessarily time restraints or time requirements, yeah. right? If you get your work done and we see the impact, we see the results, that's what we really kind of advocate. And that's been a really transformational thing that I think is really cool because we have people that we know are extremely loyal to us as a biz, as a company. Right. And we know that they're going to be with us long term. And we've, I mean, our turnover rate is like absolutely nothing. Like people have been with us for years and they'll continue That's to awesome. be there. And we know that because we're a little family now, but I know one of the biggest things in relation to what they've experienced previously is that they can feel like they control their time. They can control yeah. when they work, when, how they work, so on and so forth. They're not feeling like they're being like micromanaged all the time. Yeah. And we can tell that that really resonates with them. So to your point about not being Google, we have a team of eight. We're not a big team. And that's kind of what we've created and it works both for us, it works for them. And I think it's like a beautiful thing that we've created that's more of a modern take on what an organization and how it looks like. It's awesome. I mean, because look, the reality is with most work and nowadays everybody's working in some distributed you know, way, most of the work doesn't have to happen between certain hours necessarily. Sure. Right. I mean, like you and I have this interview scheduled, so we have to do it at this time or right. right. But so again, if you can empower your team based on the role that they have and the work that they do and works for their life. I mean, look, right now, a lot of these big companies I'm working with, too, even if they didn't have much of a work from home culture, everyone's working from home. People have kids at home doing school online in some cases sure. or whatever. We have to be more flexible. And you guys have set your business up this way. But for everybody listening and watching, if you're an entrepreneur and you have a business or a distributed team, it's understanding the nature of the work right. and then mapping that to what's going to empower the people on the right. team and what's going to get the work done. You know, there are times where we're going to have to figure out, sure. even if everyone's around the world, we're all going to get on the same Zoom call so we can talk to each other. So let's right. work that out. But right. other than that, there really are, as we're learning now, a lot of the work can be done somewhat independently yes. and we can collaborate with each other using different tools and platforms. And that seems to be the future of work. I, even I was just about to say the that. Pandemic. Yeah. I was just about to say that. I think, I think we talked about opportunities from challenges. I think the biggest opportunity that's going to come out of this is we're going to reinvent what the workplace looks like because yes. a it's not going to exist in the capacity that it did before but i've said this many times and i want to see if you agree with this there's a lot of issues that we have that extend beyond just the workplace right yes. i would say affordability and housing is a big concern because everybody kind of works in a centralized hub there's no right. reason for that anymore i i think also environmentally right i'm, yeah. I'm totally for the green movement but there's steps to achieving that 100 percent achieving that right and i yeah. think a big part of eliminating some of those issues that we have right now is guess what we're not fighting down the concrete jungle every day to get to a building where we all just kind of pile in and answer phones because I can Listen, answer my phone at home and not get in the car altogether. Like I've loved not having traffic. That's amazing. Yes. So there's I, issues I, that we can solve beyond just the workplace that I think there's a huge opportunity in addition to the flexibility of not wasting an hour, hour and a half, two hours of your day fighting through traffic, which is going to raise your cortisol and stress levels. It means you're not going to be present in your family life, which means now you're gaining back two hours of your day to spend with things that are more important, whether it's in your work or with your kids or what have you. So yes. there's just huge opportunities that we have. Sorry I, for yet another monologue. but No, I, I, I love it. I agree. I mean, what's interesting, you and I were mentioning right before we hit record, you know, you live down in Austin. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. There's all these people migrating from California yeah. to Austin, but to other places, because in some ways, if we don't, if we're not tied to a location, why am I going to live in San Francisco yes. or New York City or somewhere that's incredibly expensive? Unless I love it there. Look, I love it here in the Bay Area. I probably won't go anywhere personally. We love it. We've set up our life here, but it is incredibly expensive. And if the only reason to be here, just say, for example, someone lives out here because they want to work in Silicon Valley, it's like, yep. well, if I could live in Albuquerque, New Mexico, <laughs> or I can live in wherever, somewhere around the world and still do my work and still be on my team and still work for my company... Why am I going to do that? So I do think a lot of this is changing. One thing, though, I'll say on the other side of it, I do um, think what we're also realizing is there are certain things that we're all missing from being I agree. Together. That's what I was just about to say. So we have to figure out how do we do all this to make it work and then figure out whether it's once a year or we have a retreat or something. But yep. I'm personally not, I'm not just saying that selfishly because part of what I do for a living is speak to groups of people when yes. they gather in person. But there is still value in us all getting together for that conference, for that offsite, for that meeting where we can hug each other and slap high fives and be in the same room. But again, we're going to have to figure out how to do that creatively and safely. And then ultimately, how does it benefit the business? Yeah, I think as humans, we need, we require that, right? Yeah. What is it like the average person needs like 17 forms of, of you know, an exp like whether it's a hug or, or yeah. you know, some kind of physical touch, but also too, and I want to see if you agree with this, because this really affects leadership, right? And determining where you're going to go with your organization. I think friction of ideology 
in communion with other thought leaders is so fundamentally important. Yes. Now, one would argue, and I would say this, I, I worked, my previous business was not a, a, a virtual company and we were, you know, in communion with one each other, congregated at a certain, you know, location, my office right. before, and now going from, from this, I would say I've, I've, I've grown more from this because I added the, the dynamic of doing what I'm doing right now with you, which is right. interviews, right? I didn't have that capacity. I was building a brick and mortar business. Right. So I wish I had had that at that time. And yes. the reason being is because I benefit every week. I feel like I have mentorship right now. I'm learning yeah. from you last week. It was whomever, right? It's thought yeah. leaders. It's New York times, bestselling authors. It's Damon Johns. It's Grant Cardone. Like it's big, yeah. like people that have been at the top of the top of their industry. And I've done it all remote. Like very yeah. few of them have been done in person. So do you think we can fully replicate that or synthesize that in the offline or in the online space rather that we do in terms of just learning and growing together as a species and as leaders? I think it's necessary. I mean, I do think there's some hybrid model, right? We do need that human touch, that human interaction, as you were right. talking about for our mental and emotional well-being, as well as there are certain conversations and certain type of work, as we're all learning now, that is limited when it can only be done virtually. That yes. said, to your point, and it's especially now that we're sort of right on the cusp of this election here in the US, yeah. what can be challenging, we get into group think. And Oof, so again, yeah. living here, like I grew up here in the San Francisco Bay Area, it, you know, it's considered liberal and progressive and open-minded and all that. And it is, and you know what, there's a group think here, even in I Silicon would, Valley, that you have to think this way and you have to believe these things and yeah, you have to say these things. And the same thing, you go down to Atlanta or you go to New York City or you go even these places where there people, even in, in Austin, Texas, like what we yeah. want to do is get out of our own little bubbles, mm. even out of the US and seeing things from other perspectives. If the work we're doing in the business we have, we want to reach people around the world. We yeah. can't just sit in our own little room with a bunch of people, even if we may look a little different that are basically living and breathing the same totally air agree. all the time. So again, it's got to be a combination of those things. Totally and I agree. think, you know, this is a great opportunity for us to revisit and look at how do we set that up in a way that benefits our businesses? I totally agree. Um, I just had a conversation with a, a gentleman that was deemed to be controversial on my show. Um, <laughs> and in many ways, rightfully so. But it was for the reason you just mentioned, right? The group think. And I think that really is magnified on the internet. Yes. right. Really magnified on the internet, right? And so you said something about your area specifically, which is what prompted me uh, to, to have that conversation with him because yep. uh, my, my friend said that... I could not come to San Francisco and I identify as a conservative Christian, right? right? And so he said, if you came here and said that, you would want to rethink that label because it wouldn't, it wouldn't fly, right? Because right. it's just, it's become that's, there's a certain way of thinking and a certain way of right. behaving and acting and being, right? And that right. doesn't fall in line with that. So I do think there is a lot of potential dangers to furthering that groupthink online yeah. where on in the offline space, I can have that conversation or even a face-to-face -face like what we're doing right now. I can tell you right. that. Whereas if I type that on Twitter and said, I'm a conservative Christian, 100% of my comments are getting exploded with, well, you know, all these accusatory things that are probably not true about me, right? right? And likely not true about me. And I always say this, I'm like, every time you say something, you have to be mindful of the fact that there's someone that you deeply care about that's on the other side of what you just said or what totally. you think and feel. But we forget that a lot. We do. And there's that, you know, Brene Brown talks a lot about this and I agree with it. It's that notion of it's hard to hate people up close. And what she means by that, and I think, look, it, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook, Instagram, on social media, or in that sort of two-dimensional world, it's easy to then, whether you use a label of conservative Christian or any other label, and then that, oh, that makes you, you're on that team or you're on that side or you're yeah, in that. Right. But, then, but then when we have a real conversation with someone, what mm. we realize is there's all this nuance and there's all this depth, depth and there's all this complexity and paradox in being human and thinking and believing all the things mm. that we believe. Yeah. And when we get really close to people, even when we disagree and we're able to have sure. a real authentic conversation, what we find is, oh, there's actually more common ground than we yes. realize. Yes. There's more like, oh, there's nuance to this. There, you know, one yeah. of the, the pillars in my book is called Embrace Sweaty Palm Conversations, yeah. which came from a conversation I had with a mentor of mine years ago. Chris, he said to me, Mike, what stands between you and the kind of relationships you want to have with people is usually a 10-minute sweaty palm conversation mm. you're too afraid to have. Interesting. 
So can we have those sweaty palm conversations? That's why as great as all of the distributed work is and all the platforms and all the slacks and, you know, Twitters of the world, <laughs> nothing replaces having human to human interaction, real time conversations, because what gets lost in the social media world, and this circling back to leadership, we have to remember is you can send great emails and Slack messages and have very efficient communication, but what doesn't get communicated electronically is empathy. Yes is understanding is human connection. Yes. And the only way to really connect human to human and express that empathy is to be on the phone or on Zoom, or if we can get together face to face from time to time, mm. that's where we get to give and receive that sense of empathy and connection. And ultimately, that's what great leaders do. Yes, now let me ask you this, and I, I know we gotta let you go, we're out of time here. <laughs> um, so, I, I love a lot of what you just said, and I want to make sure we really highlight that because I think it's important. I think one of the things you're seeing is not just certain geographical areas, but also certain technology companies that there's yep. become also kind of a monolith, right, yep. of, of certain ideologies and people kind of falling in line with that. What can those leaders do? Because should be told, one of the things you said I think is so important to, to notate is there's only so much that you can actually, um, that I can actually describe. So you said this, like whether I identify, you know, conservative Christian, right? My, the, honestly, the probably the main difference, like you said, in terms of common ground, probably the only huge fundamental difference between myself as a moderate Christian or right leaning person is mm -hmm. in a moderate left leaning person is I just don't want to be taxed, right? Like that's right. the big, like, I just don't want to be taxed at a ridiculous rate. That's probably sure. one of my bigger things. And other yeah. than that, like I can see the, the merit in a lot of other arguments, right? I'm like, okay, right. yeah, I, I could see the benefit of increasing minimum wage and having a livable wage. Like I can totally see the merit in that. Yep. You don't have those conversations. But anyways, that's beside yes. the point. I just want to provide some commentary on that. Yeah. In these big organizations where it has become that way, where now I see with Facebook, for example, where Zuckerberg is being pressured in a lot of ways, where it's almost like they've created a culture of people that think a certain way and live in a certain region. And I don't think that necessarily he shares a lot of those beliefs. I don't think that, right. I think people think he sits in there and he's like, yeah, I'm going to cancel this and censor that. I don't think he's doing that, but I think that right. there are people within his organization that do carry those beliefs personally. And it's really hard for them to kind of draw that line of distinction between this is my personal, my work life versus this, and it kind of, they're bleeding in together. Right? So yeah. how do we create environments as leaders where that doesn't happen? Right? Because when you do have organizations that are hundred thousand plus employees, things yeah. can kind of spiral out of control. Well, I think there's a couple things. Look, th I mean, there's a lot to what you just said and asked, but I like for years, there's been this notion of the liberal media. Let's just use that as an example, sure. right? And in one case, and I remember hearing someone say years ago, and I read this piece that talked about, there's a difference between having a bunch of more liberal left-leaning people who happen to live and work, say in New York City in the media, right. versus then having an agenda of trying to sort of influence something. Do you know what I mean? So you have yeah. an organization, say, let's just use Facebook as an example. Let's just say if you say, oh, well, it's a Bay Area based, Silicon Valley based tech company, and it's got offices in a bunch of cities and urban areas around the US and around the world, mm -hmm. the people who live in those areas are more stereotypically sort of left leaning liberal, they work there. Is that the same as then the platform and the organization itself sort of having an agenda and trying yes. to forward that agenda? And, and I think we have to look at all of across the political spectrum, we have to look at news outlets and, and you know, uh, content providers or platforms like Facebook and really question that. Mm. Then there's a separate issue with it, which is also about truth and information and disinformation. You know what I mean? So a lot of these things play on That's, top of each other. Yeah. At the end of the day, though, what it does come down to, I believe, is it does come down to leadership and an ability irrespective of maybe our own ideology. Yes. And I sometimes think about Mark Zuckerberg and not to apologize for him or defend him, but like when he started Facebook in his dorm room at 19 years old at Harvard, I don't think he could have possibly imagined no. fast forward all these years later, no, my no, no, platform no. is going to somehow influence the election maybe. Yes. And then, you know, so I think in some cases though, we have to be mindful in these tech companies, especially these social media companies have to be mindful of like, oh, wow, the genie's out of the bottle on these things and they've gotten to be so much bigger than we ever thought. Yes. That circles back around to what most businesses are organized around. And you and I know this as business owners, they're organized around profit. Yes. And that's why I do believe things like conscious capitalism and compassionate leadership, yes. servant leadership are so important because at some level, without being holier than thou about it, we have to also remember, yes, we're in business to make money, of course, but aren't we here to actually provide a service yes. and to try to have a positive influence in the world? And so yes. that to me feels like a big debate that we have to continue to have in business these days. 
because I think we're seeing the impact of if all we do is focus on the profit, that can have negative impacts on the planet, on human beings, on how we communicate and interact. And, and I don't think any of these technology companies decided, oh, you know what we're going to do? We're going to distract everybody so they can't sleep and they don't take care of themselves. We're going to make everyone fight with each other and yell at each other about politics. They're, but like, right. no, but there's a lot of money in getting eyeballs and people to engage. It's tough, man. So how do you reconcile that? That's really, really, really tough. But I totally agree. And I do think a lot of the answers to a lot of these issues we're experiencing both in business and in, in our world, it's it comes down to leadership. It really yeah. does. Even if it's even if it's just leadership in your own home, right? Yeah. I think that's that's something that we really overlook. And I think what ends up happening is is that things get so bad that you really hinge your entire future, right, on one person in the federal government, meaning whoever's going right. to be president. And I'm like, guys, if that if that's really what we think is going to be our saving grace, then we're getting it all wrong, right? Totally. Like we have to play our fundamental individual roles yep. in whatever capacity we can. And whoever's in the White House is whoever's in the White House. Right. Well, and that person, whoever it is, and we're about to find out newly, but in the right. future generations, he or she, they work for us. And I think we sometimes right. forget right. that, right? Like right. all of our leaders and work for us. they're not a dictator, us. you know? No. Thank God. No. I know. For sure. For sure. Interesting. All right, man. We could, again, we could go down this rabbit hole too, as well as sports and go for hours and hours and hours. I yes. do appreciate it. I wanted to get into emotional intelligence, but we are straight out of time. So I want to make sure that that is something that you do talk about in the book oh, yeah. is emotional intelligence in leadership, because I do for think sure. there's some misconceptions about it specifically, whether it's static or not. Yeah. So I want to make sure that we make note of that. If people are interested in reading the book, uh, that they do know that's in there as well. But uh, yes. let's go ahead and provide documentation in terms of links and what have you, as far as where people can learn more about you and the book, Mike. Yeah, best place to do that is at our website, which is just mike-robbins.com. Cool. All right, man. I appreciate your time. I enjoyed the conversation. Me too, man. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for what you're doing and uh, keep up the good work. All right, buddy. Sounds great, man. See ya. 